You're in their country with no money on you at all. You just got your tickets to go home and they're drugs. We should never have done something that stupid. Dodgy guys, guns and stuff. They knew where we lived in the UK. I said, what's in these? And they went, that's what you're taking. This is what you're carrying. Oh, what? Couldn't keep my eyes off the amount of drugs. And we thought. We were bitten off a bit more than we could chew, like. Never felt like that before. One of the scariest moments of my life. I was shaking. My heartbeat was going really fast. God, I thought he'd been caught then. Scotland, I was working for BT. I was uh, on a call centre, it was a rubbish job. Getting bored of it, I was there for maybe four years. I was working in a kitchen in Exeter, just working God knows how many hours every week, like 50, 60 hours a week, trying to keep the kitchen afloat. And never got any time to myself, and even when I got paid, still, still problems with the rent, trying to just, just keep on top of things. Absolutely appalling. <laughs> Yeah, just decided to live in Ibiza because it's sunshining constantly, everyone's happy, everyone's cheerful, and it's not the UK. Party, happy times, nothing like the UK. I was already in Ibiza for maybe a month before I actually met Lucy. It was the very, very beginning of the season, and Scott was a friend of one of my friends already, so he introduced us, and that was just it. Well, she pulled me. <laughs> he moved into my house that week, and yeah, <laughs> together ever since. Man. Spent the whole season together working. Yeah, he just never went home. <laughs> Bless him. Me and Scott had known each other about five months before, before we got arrested, I think. When the season starts coming to an end in Ibiza, it's really nerve-wracking. Most people tend to go home, go back to England, go back to their respective jobs or their respective wives or whatever they do. I didn't want to go back this year, and I know Scott didn't want to go back to Scotland either. Now, Bifa, it's a complete ghost town after September. We didn't really want to stay in Bifa for the whole time, you know what I mean? Lucy Dent before and says it's really boring. It's just trapped on a tiny little island, basically, in winter. So no more parties. It gets quite cold as well, the swimming pools will freeze over and stuff. The money, like I say, is very, very scarce. You have to make enough money during the summer season to be able to see yourself through the winter season because there is no work in Ibiza in winter. We didn't put enough away to, uh, to survive a winter. We got two cheap flights, got to Amsterdam, booked ourselves into a hostel. You know, they do tiny little, like, pensions like they do in France, like, uh, really, really cheap. We paid for the, the hostel for five, six days. I thought this should be enough time for to actually find some work. We were just going into every bar we could come across. It looked decent, anyway. We were just trailing around bars, 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 and seeing if we could actually find some work. going in, sitting down, having a few beers, chatting to people, going on to the next one, having a few more beers. It was an excuse for like an extended pub crawl, but job hunting at the same time, yeah, it was good. Trailed around bar after bar after bar, and there was obviously nothing going, there was no work. We didn't have much money at all. We were pretty broke. We didn't even know if we had enough money to go back to the UK. We were becoming desperate. We went to a bar that we'd been to many times before. Like We'd actually asked for work and stuff. There was no work there. I remember sitting at the bar with Scott. It's a dark, smoky little, pro proper little, small, dark, dingy Amsterdam bar. A guy came up to us. It's a guy we didn't even know. Came up to us, bought us a couple of drinks. A Dutch guy. 
anything personal. He was one of the lads kind of thing. Straight away, just came up chatting to his bouncy. Seemed like a nice guy, and we thought we could trust him. I said, I've seen you walking about looking, looking depressed with no work, and I've possibly got some work for you. And he said, uh, that's not exactly legal. If you're interested, it's a way you can make some money if you're really up for it. And we, me and Scott both went, come on, tell us about it, please. Sounds interesting. He said, you've got to go over to Costa Rica and uh, bring back some, some marijuana. Maybe two and a half kilo each of uh, cannabis. Me and Scott were both, I don't know. <laughs> not, not quite sure, man, sounds a bit dodgy. He was very, uh, very persuasive. And he says, go over to Costa Rica, all expenses paid for a two week holiday. Stay in a hotel of his choosing. They get in contact with us on the first evening. Leave us alone for the rest of the holiday. They deliver us some blocks of marijuana. We'd go to the airport the next day. Said it would be x-ray proof. Come home. Give them the suitcases, they give us our money. Everyone goes off happy. And he says, it's 5,000 each, 10,000 euros. We thought, wow. This is, this is a lot of cash. We can we can live in that for the whole winter, even go back to Ibiza for next summer and still have cash, you know. He said, well, think about it. If you're up for it, he said, I'll be in this bar tomorrow night. Come back and we'll have a chat. So me and Scott both left. Proper didn't know what to say to each other. We were like, oh, our dad's dodgy, man. But pff, he'd offered us quite a bit of money for doing it. That evening, me and Scott went back to our hotel. We were actually broke, so we were actually panicking a little bit. Like We didn't know exactly how to get back to the UK. There's maybe a couple of days left of our bed and breakfast we paid for. Me and Scott were both discussing the pros and cons of obviously what was going to happen, the major con obviously being getting caught. We knew it was absolutely stupid to transport stuff through customers and through airports. We thought if we were going to get caught, it would be in Costa Rica, which is not a really nice place to get caught in, but no one gets caught. Everything's safe. And plus, it's legal in Amsterdam. No one gives a damn about the stuff. Lucy thought it was a better idea than I actually did. So I decided to actually flip a coin. Scott was like, right, I'll toss a coin. So I was like, right, fine, we've got to live by the results. So no matter what the results say, we've got to live by them. Scott's like, yep, definitely, definitely. So you flicked a coin. Never done anything like this before. You read in the books about people that have got locked up in Thailand and stuff. I remember reading a couple of months before we left, uh, Forget You Had a Daughter. That was by some bird that got locked up in Thailand. Fantastic book, and I was reading it going, oh, poor girl, absolutely terrible. But, yeah, you, you just don't think it's going to happen to you, do Churchill to give you a better home insurance deal. Home insurance? Oh, yes. OK, can you guarantee to beat the renewal price on my home insurance? Oh, yes. Can I make a claim without filling in any forms? Oh, yes. Can I have your autograph? Oh, yeah, I'm all steady. Come on, homeowners, challenge Churchill. Yes. If you haven't claimed for three years, we guarantee to beat the renewal price for your home insurance. Introducing new Glade Wisp. With an attractive new design, Wisp releases the same amount of wonderful fragrance with every puff. Seven puffs, 245, 506. So the last puff smells as great as the first. New Glade Wisp. Glade, the welcoming scent of home. I'm leaning over my baby's cot, who's only three months old and has a fever. So I've given him some Nurofen for children, which works where it's needed with his little baby thermostat, helping reduce his temperature so he'll feel OK. Nurofen for children. Nothing reduces fever faster or for longer. Two for one.
at Specsavers. To unblock plug holes, don't use bleach because it's just too thin, even the thick ones. But Mr. Muscle Sink and Plug Hole Unblocker is a very thick gel, so it sinks through the water and clings to the clog to clear the blockage in no time. Mr. Muscle Sink and Plug Hole Unblocker loves the jobs you hate. I think you'd better set the table fast. We got a hole the meeting tonight. tonight. We got a hole the meeting tonight. tonight. We got a hole the meeting tonight. So we can It's so easy to make dinner more exciting. Uncle Ben's Express Egg Fried Rice does it in just two minutes. Uncle Ben's perfect every time. Right now at Subway, get a delicious six-inch sub of the day made fresh in front of you and an ice-cold Coke Zero for just two forty-nine. dollars Subway, eat fresh. Hey, how many other beans have got a ride like this? Just look at the custom paint job. The three-inch metallic rims. And you all know about the sumptuous orange interior. <laughs> Hot. Or cold. Come on, drop the lid. Take it for a spin. It's a classic, I tell you. A classic. Check out the badge. Beans means Heinz. Sainsbury's Taste the Difference range has hundreds of new things to try. Like this marble topped chocolate cake. Try it with a splash of Chantilly cream. And with no artificial colors, flavors, or hydrogenated fats added, you can add your own touch of zest. Sainsbury's. Try something new today. Budia loves to run. He's just four years old. Budia runs in 90 degree heat. He runs about 20 miles every day. Shouldn't someone now make him stop? Extraordinary people. The four-year-old who ran 40 miles. Nine o'clock next Monday on Five. At that point, we were actually broke. We didn't know exactly where we were going to get cash from. We didn't know how we were going to get back to the UK. It was two weeks, all expenses paid, in a nice hotel in Costa Rica with spending money. Lucy thought it was a better idea than I actually did, so I decided to actually flip a coin. Scott was like, right, I'll toss a coin. No matter what the results say, we've got to live by them. Scott's like, yep, definitely, definitely. So he flicked a coin. and it came up heads, which is no-go. And I was like, right, final one. If it comes up as a no-go, it's a no-go. And he flicked it. And it was heads again, which is a no-go. We both looked at each other and went, well, we're going anyway, aren't we? Yeah, I totally ignored the coin toss. I convinced myself, well, a few beers, a few vodkas, and it was... <laughs> that, that part of my head just kind of took over and says, let's do the job. Second evening, went to the bar and he was, he was there again. He said if we thought about it. I mean, Scott both said, yeah, please. We're both very interested if you want to explain to us in full detail, which he did. He said, uh, I pay for your tickets and everything. You go over to Costa Rica and stay in a, in a place that I tell you to stay. He said, you'll be contacted over there and uh, these guys will give you some blocks of marijuana. He said, I expect you to bring them back to Amsterdam and you'll be paid as soon as you get back. And end of story. We were curious. It was like, well, how are we going to bring it back then? And the guy said, there's no problem going through customs. He said, it'll be x-ray proof as well. Once you've got out of Costa Rica, he said, you're home free. No problems at all. And he actually said that the, the same job had been done back and forth, no problems. The Costa Rican guys had done it, and they hadn't been caught. We're a British couple, nobody would suspect us. We thought, well, yeah, let's go for it. We agreed, no problem at all. We thought, yep, <laughs> sounds like a good enough plan, man, no risk. I think we both thought we were kind of invincible, actually. 
photocopies of our passports and everything, so you knew where we lived. You knew all the information about us. We knew where our family stayed, and he said that was perfectly normal. So we knew we couldn't jump out of it in the last minute and stuff. He turned around, gave us our tickets, and said, you're flying out tomorrow. And we were like, wow. <laughs> and you've got to remember, we didn't know what we were going to do for the winter, man. This was a two weeks, all expenses paid holiday to Costa Rica, man. <laughs> Well excited. It's like being little kids again and doing something really bad. <laughs> Me and Scott were laughing our heads off. We couldn't believe it though. Big grand hotel. It was a big foyer, marble floors, proper nice four star hotel. We both kept looking at each other and we were like, what, what are we doing, man? <laughs> What's going on? Why are we doing this? Yeah, it was terrifying, but we're really, really excited at the same time, man. We were told when we were in Amsterdam that on the second night, someone would introduce themselves. We knew we had to meet the guys to show that we'd actually got there and that we were ready to do the job. They said to us, if you go out at all on the second day, wear a cap. There's going to be people around, and if they see you wearing a blue cap, they'll be able to recognise you more easily. So when I left the house that day, I had to wear a blue baseball cap. Lucy wore the cap. We had to go and meet them just maybe the next block from the hotel itself. And they were going to recognise us, come speak to us. I mean, Scott was deadly nervous, man. Deadly nervous. We're like, oh no, what are these people going to be like? They're going to be gangsters or something. Yeah, I was looking out for them everywhere. I couldn't see anyone that looked like a suspicious cartel dealer. You know? <laughs> so if they were there, we didn't see them. Didn't see them at all. And I really was looking. But it wasn't necessary as they came to our rooms anyway. They left Mission Reception for us. They're going to make contact again. We were told someone would come to our rooms and introduce themselves, and that's what happened. Two Costa Rican men, one spoke a tiny, tiny little bit of English, the other spoke none at all. We kind of got the, the general idea. They were just happy that we'd arrived, they were checking up on us. They were big guys, they were kind of dodgy-looking gangsters, but we kind of expected that had a minimal conversation. They weren't in the room for any more than two minutes. Said, have a nice holiday. We will be watching you occasionally. We'll be back on your last night. And then left again. Everything was as planned, as we've been told. And there was absolutely no problems and no hitches. And we thought everything was good as gold. doing what we're doing at Bifa, but absolutely no problems with money. We're shopping a lot. Costa Rica's got a fantastic shopping strip. <laughs> we had a great fun. Really enjoyed ourselves. Really did. Half the time we stayed in the room. We got loads of bottles of vodka. We got, we got drunk nearly all the time, anyway. So it was just happy, happy. It was fantastic. I've never actually abused a room service system so much in my life, man. Proper. Yeah, it was really good. The whole holiday, we managed to put the actual reason we were there out of our mind. We just took it as a two-week holiday. Yay. It was like a kind of unspoken agreement. We didn't discuss it once we were on holiday. We were on holiday to enjoy ourselves, man. We, do, we didn't discuss the situation at all. It was always niggling slightly at the back of your head, like always. But we were there, we, we were gonna do it. We might as well make, like, take advantage of the situation. There's no point sitting in the room moping and being more scared and nervous, because otherwise, what's the point of being there, Johnny? You know I mean? 
we get back from doing something or going shopping or something, we'll both be like, oh, we know why we're here. It's always at the back of mind niggling you. We didn't even contemplate worrying at all until maybe the night before we were going to get the stuff. When it got close to the last day, then we sat down and went, right, we'll work out what we're going to do now. But starting to get more and more nervous at that point. So we were obviously pretty nervous that day. Like We knew it was the last night and we knew we had to do the stuff and we had to do the trip the next day. We thought it would just be like a... A couple of little plastic bags that we'd be putting under uh, under our clothes and suitcases and stuff. So uh, we knew we had to meet the guy. They picked us up and we went off with them. And uh, just street lights passing by, and I just look at it, Scott. And they drove us around a bit, didn't have a clear where we were. We were both in the back, and they said, The bag's are in the floor. And said, Right, there's two, two suitcases there, they're yours. And we tried to lift them up, and they were really heavy. And the guys were like, Well, I said to the guys, What's up? What's in these? And they went, that's what you're taking. And Scott picked up the other one, and we were both like, we both looked at them. We obviously said, this is way too much. This is a hell of a lot more than two and a half kilo each. And uh, is it still supposed to be disguised as holiday knickknacks, etc.? And they were just going, this was the deal from the start. This is what you're going to be carrying. This is what you carry. And this is when we felt a little bit intimidated by the guys, like, because they obviously were dodgy guys, guns and stuff, and we thought, what can we say now? We're, we're pretty much stuck. This is what we're going to have to do. Can't hear what we're going to do now. We obviously couldn't do a runner because they were obviously going to watch us and make sure we didn't do anything with their, their staff, you know what I mean? And obviously, they, they wanted us to get in the plane. Got the cases into the hotel, and uh, I was like, right, we must get our clothes in, basically, get packed. When we opened the cases, and there was just briefcase after briefcase after briefcase after briefcase. And me and Scott were like, well, it's not supposed to be that much. We didn't want anything to do with it at all. We didn't want anything to do with the cases. We didn't want to touch them. We even rubbed our fingerprints off the briefcase itself. We didn't even want to look inside. didn't want to touch it. didn't want to do anything. It was too late. They'd gone, we had no means of contacting them, and they were watching us anyway. They had our passports, well, our photocopies of our passports. They knew where we lived in the UK. So, just get on with it then. No, we've spent their money. We had two weeks in a hotel paid for by them. There's nothing you can do, just do it. So, we just went along with it then. never felt like that before. It's totally, totally, there's nothing you can do. When you're in their country, with no money on you at all, you've just got your tickets to go home and, and they're drugs. What, what can you do? It took hours and hours to try to pack it because there was a lot of stuff, wasn't there? Two briefcases and they said that you've got to keep them in the briefcases as well. 
There was no option in how we packed it. We had to take these cases and we had to take the briefcases in like that. I had to pack our clothes on top, so I had to iron all my clothes and iron all Scott's clothes perfectly and make them all, like, pack out properly. So I opened up a couple of boxes of Tampax as well and sprinkled them all over. <laughs> so I thought, if the customs man opened that, he's not going to want to root through a couple of boxes of Tampax. Like, yeah. <laughs> definitely very much out of control from the moment they gave us the suitcases and we we realized bitten off a bit more than we could chew like that evening after picking up the suitcases we were both really nerve-wracked and it was a, it was a really early morning flight as well so we knew we only had about four hours sleep Yeah, just tried to get our heads down just for a few hours. We didn't sleep very well because uh, it, was, it was just pure nerves. It wasn't easy, man. It was a proper bit of <laughs> four sleepless hours. Lying there thinking, what's going to happen to us? Caught in customs, or we need to get our bags searched. What's going to happen? I was trying not to think too hard about it. If you think about it, you're going to look guilty for a start. I think I was trying to just be really easygoing and just just go with the situation. Britain, we urge you to challenge Churchill. Challenge Churchill? Yes, person of Britain. Challenge Churchill to give you a better insurance deal. Can you guarantee to beat the price I'm paying now for my car insurance? Oh, yes. Hey, Churchill, what about home insurance? Can you do the same for that? Oh, yes. And do you have call centres in this country? Oh, yes. Come on, Britain. Challenge Churchill. If you haven't claimed for three years, we guarantee to beat your renewal price. Oh, yes. There's a fine line between winning and losing. Sometimes, just a few milliliters. You can now get AOL wireless broadband with a free router for just $14.99 a month. Do we really need wires to communicate? Kids can get a lot out of something simple. There's nothing simpler than the single grain of rice we use to make each rice crispy. It's a lookout. It's a poo stick. Kellogg's Rice Krispies. The simpler, the better. Extreme style. Break the mold. What I want is to really get rid of that odour. What I like is when it smells fresh and clean. What's so important is that house doesn't just mask bad odours. For me, 
It's Oust, definitely. Oust really works. Thousands of people have voted Oust product of the year. Don't just cover up bad odors, get Oust. And for your bathroom, the Oust Mini Spray. It's just perfect to get rid of those nasty bathroom smells. SC Johnson, a family company. It's got to be tonight. It's got to be tonight. Did you know that thousands of men are impotent because they smoked? Probably not, because they don't like to talk about it. Every cigarette you smoke causes fatty deposits that restrict the flow of blood to your penis. And this damage is happening right now. For help and advice on giving up, call 0800 169 0169. Definitely very much out of control from the moment they gave us the suitcases and we, we realised bitten off a bit more than we could chew, like. This is way too much. This is a hell of a lot more than two and a half kilo each. I mean, Scott were like, well, this is, it's not supposed to be that much. And they were just going, this was the deal from the start. This is what you're going to be carrying. This is what you carry. I think we had a wake-up call at about 4, 4.30. Literally got ready, flew round the room, got everything together, shower changed, straight into a taxi to the airport. They said to us, we will have people following you in the morning from the hotel to the airport just to make sure you go through all right and there's no hassles. Could have been just hyped to get us to the airport. But at the end of the day, we did have a hell of a lot of their drugs on us. Arrived at the airport, unloaded all our bags, and uh, wandered inside to see where our checkout was and everything. The flight was one big long stand, and right at the end, you had two customs men stood there with a table, and they were just picking up suitcases, going through every suitcase. We both realised that this could be a problem. A big problem. Oh, oh no. What are we gonna do? They're, they're checking all the suitcases. We try to keep it together. Scott was like, don't panic, it's alright, cool, we'll just get a porter. We called a porter and the guy put all our three suitcases on the luggage trolley. And he walks through with us, we're walking along behind, and you've got to remember, you are trying not to look nervous or anything, you've got to completely put it out of your head, you can't, you can't think about it, because otherwise the whites of your eyes are going to be showing, man, they're going to pick you up in seconds, you know what I mean? The heartbeat was going really fast and uh, we were sweating a bit. Probably one of the scariest moments of my life, seeing the bags getting searched and obviously knowing that we've got lots of stuff on us. I was shaking, shaking like a leaf man. I had to give the tickets to Scott to hand over. I couldn't even hand them over. And we thought, if it happens now, it happens now.
And the customs guy just looked at our baggage trolley, looked at these three huge suitcases and just waved us straight through. This is it. We've passed it. Wow, we've done it, thank God. When we got to the other side, we went straight to the bar and ordered a beer. And, yeah, it was fine, it was just relief. Absolute blessed relief. It was like, oh, we've done it. The bags were going to be a bit straight through Amsterdam. We'd never see the bags again. We thought, we've gotten away with it. We were absolutely delighted. Both of us sat down and talked about it. We should never have done something that stupid. It was ridiculous. I mean, it wasn't. It was the handing of the tickets that made you really think, God, if we'd have been caught then, and seeing the customs guys, you know. Boarded the plane and, oh, the relief, man. There wasn't any, like, army outside <laughs> ready to stop the plane or anything like that. We thought to ourselves, this is it. We're absolutely delighted. We're going, we've gotten away with it. We were sitting on the plane from Costa Rica to Mexico. We were like, we've done it. Oh. <sighs> yes, this is it. No problems at all, we've got away with it. We were big smiles on our faces, but obviously we tried to keep a straight face. That whole happy feeling lasted the whole journey. It wasn't straight from Costa Rica to Amsterdam, but we had to do a stop in Mexico to change the aeroplanes. We thought everything was cool, but bags were locked straight through Amsterdam, and then we'd be, we'd be sorted. Got to Mexico, and we only had one hour in Mexico. So we got into Barch Lounge, then we found out we had to get our visas signed. Ran straight to immigration to stamp our immigration forms. Did our visa thing, had to run back. By the time we'd done that, that was an hour. And they'd already called lights flight on our plane. So we legged it straight to our booking desk, handed in our tickets, handed in our immigration forms. And there was quite a few people standing around the desk, like official looking types. Walked up the gangplank towards the plane. We could actually see the, the doorway of the plane. And I had one foot on the aeroplane itself. Oh, he was big. Baker. Baker. You knew in our hearts that it was because they'd actually searched the bags. I knew there was no other reason on earth why they would call me back, apart from the fact that they'd found the drugs. We've seen uh, a customs guy, a federal cop, a gang, calf's holster. They were like, oh, can you come with us, please? And I was like, oh, the plane's going to go, the plane's going to go. Uh, can we come back? What's going on? They said, if you'd like to follow us, please. I was like, but we plane, you won't follow us. It's really hard to describe the feeling. It's the most nervous and scared I've been ever. So we followed them right the way down to, like, the bowels of the airport then all these through these little rooms and passages and through all these past all these x-ray machines until uh came to this one room and our suitcases were just spread on the table me and scott just absolutely oh, we were terrified terrified man shaking like a leaf already hot wet cold sweat they just pulled their briefcases out and scott just looked at the briefcases and just looked at me and i was like oh here we go we said we didn't want to touch it because it, was, it wasn't ours Try to make up little stories, but 
they hardly even spoke in English anyway. And they undid the first briefcase. They said to us, do you know what's in here? And we both went, no, haven't got a clue. And they pulled it out and it was a, a package wrapped in some, like silver foil, which I presume was what was going to x-ray proof it. One of the briefcases had packs in that weren't silver foiled and it was just pure white powder. I mean, the Scots just looked at each other and went, oh, no, no, we're really in trouble, man. This is when I actually realised it was coke. Big kilo blocks of coke. They were sticking the tester into it and <laughs> checking out the gauge of what the cocaine was and then testing it themselves. It's the coppers in the, in the airport and testing it themselves, going, woohoo, that's really good. And all this stuff. It's the coppers, man. Snorting it in front of us and everything. And they picked it up, weighed every single kilo and uh, came to 17 and a half kilos. And it was uh, pure, pure Colombian cocaine, apparently. Yeah, ma'am. Oops. <laughs> I was in shock, proper. I didn't know what I was feeling. Me and Scott didn't say a word to each other, and we just sat next to each other. Couldn't keep my eyes off the amount of drugs there. I was still shocked. I was like, what? after they'd bagged all the drugs up and everything, taken them away. And uh, they took us off to the police station. And they took Scott and me off separately. We were pretty much pointed by a machine gun to the vans outside. And they had M16 pointing us at all the time. Sirens going really crap in ourselves at this point. Huge great guns, man, huge. Pointed them everywhere. I was like, don't point that at me. We were just going, tranquilo, tranquilo. We're not going to run. And they just drove us off to the police station, but we were in separate jeeps. That was just horrific, man, because I couldn't get to Scott, couldn't get anywhere near him. I didn't know where we were going. They wouldn't speak to me, and they were pointing machine guns at me. <laughs> We were taken directly to the main police station. We were taken to this detective. It seemed like the kind of detective you get in a TV show in America. You get his gun on the desk in front of us. We never even thought about any kind of storyline, what we were going to say if we actually got caught, because it would make us more nervous actually doing the job itself. We were that confident we weren't going to get nicked. We were just going to deny our knowledge. We stuck with the story at first of the stuff being planted beat. And this policeman spoke English a bit. And he started chatting to us and he was like, look, he said, I know this route. It's been done so many times before. I know this kind of packaging. It's been done so many times before. You can say what you like, but it'll be a hell of a lot easier for you if you just admit it. He said, you admit it and you'll probably get 10 years. You start playing around and acting like fools and tell us loads of rubbish. He said, you'll probably get 20. We didn't believe him at first. But then we actually started asking, well, what were the prisons like in Mexico? And they were going, they're horrible. And at that point, I just started crying, man. I was bawling like a baby. Just going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like, we're, we're done for. We're going to get raped in jail. Me and Scott were like, should we just tell him it's ours? And then, yeah, we did. And yeah, we just agreed to tell him the truth. Admitted it. There wasn't a lot really we could have said otherwise, you know what I mean? So. We spent a day and a half in the holding cells. That seemed like the worst part of it. We didn't know what was going to happen. Were we going to see each other again for, for 10 years? We didn't, we didn't know anything. After a day and a half, must have been about eight or nine o'clock at night. And they came to pick us up. They put us in a jeep together. They had me handcuffed, sitting on the floor. 
but after maybe 10, 15 minutes, they took my handcuffs off and let me sit beside Lucy. The guards in the jeep with us were like, yeah, sit on your boyfriend's lap, sit next to him, you can kiss him, it's going to be the last time you see him for ages. We didn't know what was going to happen then, we didn't know if we were going to see each other again. So I gave Scott a kiss goodbye and I said to him, keep trying to phone the embassy, just nag everyone until you can get through to the embassy and I'll do the same thing and I'll see you as soon as I see you, basically. It was absolutely pissing rain. It was starting to get stoked already. Taken around the kind of concrete garage, made me strip off, hose me down. They obviously tried to search my ass and stuff. Like, but <laughs> yeah, it was really daunting though. And then put my clothes back on, took everything off me except for one pack of cigarettes and the one book that I had. I just felt nervous, alone, didn't know what was happening, couldn't see Lucy, didn't know what was going to happen at all. They reversed the Jeep, drove round to the other side of the prison and then got me out as well, and I'm still wearing what I was wearing for the flight. Took me into the main gate to the prison and said, there you go, new recruit, there's the paperwork, off you go. And uh, then just left me there. And Scott was gone. And it must have been about 11, 12 o'clock at night. They just opened the cell door, pushed me in, shut the cell door and walked off again. Didn't have a clue what was going on. I didn't know whether I was going to be there for years. Didn't know where Scott was. Didn't know what was happening to Scott. And didn't know what was happening. It was, yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Proper. Controlled your universe, what would you do? I'd slow things down for a better look. Ooh. Click. We are mining for pot noodle. Only 5% fat. Much lighter than you think. Tesco sport for schools and clubs. It's going really well. For instance, last year in Yorkshire, they collected enough vouchers for over 2 million ping pong balls. And over 900 javelins. And with your help, we can do even better this year. Two digital hearing aids for the price of one at Specsavers. Oh, great, a spot. It'll never go down before the party tonight. Just use this. New Clean and Clear Advantage Spot Treatment Gel works so fast that it could start to reduce redness and spot size in just eight hours. New Spot Treatment Gel. Clean and clear and under control. And now add new treatment cleansing wipes to your daily routine. For all those who like to enjoy life, we've created New Adairs. New Adairs. Let's stay strong.
botanists have spent years working with the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew to bring you botanics, a range of plant-based skin care that you won't find anywhere else. And when you spend £15 on selected great names and Boots' own brand, you'll get triple points. New spicy zinger ch types. The KFC Spicy Zinger Mix and Match Bucket, only 9 99 said you're looking at at least 10 years. We didn't believe him at first, we went, oh, no way, no way. And uh, then we actually started asking them, what were the prisons like in Mexico, and they were going, they are horrible. They put you in a room with occasional windows with bars in. The judge is somewhere on the other side of that room, and your lawyer chats to him. But you just sit in a corridor, in a bare corridor on the floor all day, whilst they chat away. The lawyer was a woman, and she was, she, she was just no help to us at all. I don't even think she was a full lawyer. She was just like a free lawyer given to us by the state, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was about 10.30 in the evening, and I was sitting in my room, and I knew the sentencing was due any time. But I got a call to Heridico, which is the, uh, the office building in the prison, and I went up there, and uh, there was just one lawyer stood there with a piece of paper which just said, you've been sentenced to 10 years, and that's it. <laughs> Sign on the line, that's it. Sign on the line, and that's your 10 years, man. Some of the dormitories are absolutely appalling for the violent girls or for the drug addicts. They're hideous. But this one and Dormitory G next to me, they're for very relaxed, no, no problems on your record people. This is my bed. It's a total mess at the moment. There's Catalina relaxing on her bed. No, you're not. Let me go you're and sleep not. Over. You're not. As you can see, there's not a lot of space, but it's all well used. What was the first place you were at night? Oh, the first of the Norte, where Scott is at, absolutely horrible. Why? Uh, so, the, the showers, there was two showers um, for, God knows, about 50 women, cockroaches as big as your feet rolling around, it's filthy dirty, it, oh, it was horrible, absolutely disgustingly filthy. Uh, this is our laundry room, where we keep all our dry foods and fruits and everything, and obviously do all our laundry and washing up. With a good view of the rest of the prison and the outside. Terry's bed, Marcus's bed, Ping Pong's bed. Uh, toilet, usually got a curtain up, but the curtain seems to have fallen down. And do you get any privacy? Not much for your privacy for. <laughs> you're, you're in a cell with seven people, you know what I mean? Not much privacy. Though. So I transferred this block because it's a protection dorm, a lot safer, le less robbing, less fighting. Obviously a better environment to be in. People are going for shit in the, the shower block and stuff. People are pissing in the hallways. The place just stunk all the time. Tramps and stuff, going, walking about. <laughs> Looked like they were full of disease. At one point I got my 
My trainers rubbed off my feet. I spent my days here, sleeping a lot, reading a lot, talking to my, my roommates, eating, nothing much else. I've resigned myself to it. You can't get angry or stressed. You're stuck now. <laughs> what, what can you do? You're in prison. It's in someone else's hands, man. You, you can scream and shout all you want and worry, but it's not going to get you out. It's not going to get you any further. So what's the point? You know what I mean? I've accepted the fact that I'm going to be stuck here, you know what I mean? Nothing else to do. Just spend each day, day by day, and just get through it, man. Not much fun to be had in here. They stick me in a in a room with uh, hundreds of hundreds of other females and no pub and no beach and no fun to be had anywhere. Yeah, that, that's prison, man. Yeah, definitely kind of curbs your fun side. Towards my grandmother, I felt guilty, definitely. Um, my grandparents. I, I'm very close to my grandparents, and I was like, oh no, Lucy, you let them down again, mate. What are you doing? But the beggar's can't be choosers, it's done now, do you know what I mean? So there's nothing I can do. And if I can sit in prison for the next five years or whatever and eat myself up with guilt, I might as well just talk myself now. So no, guilt, guilt's not, a, not an emotion I let through the door, mate. <laughs> guilt, worry, anything like that. Any, any kind of disturbing emotion that just drags you down, just don't even think about it in here. It's the thing that's got to be done. We've got to stay here, we've got to be jailed. I just did a stupid move, I'm paying the price for it. There's, I mean, there's no one else to be angry at but myself. I thought it'd be a walk in the park and it wasn't. And so, yeah, we were very naive. It's the, the lull of the money at the end of the day. They would have been, yeah, wouldn't have had to work all winter, no hassle. So, yeah, greed and naivety greatest downfalls. Yeah. I'm just living things day by day now, hoping for the five years to pass quickly, get transferred back to the UK, get freedom, try and live a life, a normal life again, you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you try not to think about when you get out because it seems like such a long time away and uh, if you start making plans now then you start thinking on the plans now and then you kind of lose the fact that you, when you're here you have to focus on the present. You really, really have to keep the present in focus because, yeah, otherwise you get too depressed, man. You start thinking about what, what life's like out there, what you're going to do when you get out, and then you realise you're not going to get out for a very long time. So, uh, yeah, you, no, you don't. You just don't plan anything. <laughs> Best not to plan anything, ever. No, I just got, yeah, focus on the present, man. One day to the next is definitely the best, man. Yeah, it's got to be. Well, the moment of truth has arrived. The theme night is about to happen, but will it be a disaster or not? Find out in Trust Me, I'm a Holiday Rep in just a moment. Why are you going to pull those pistols and whistle Dixie? 